This episode was brought to you by Pentester Academy, the leader in online cybersecurity education. Join over 10,000 professionals from 90 countries to learn security online. Also brought to you by Hacker Arsenal, artillery for cyber warriors. Visit us on hackerarsenal.com to check out our latest attack defense gadgets. I'm Marley Oxenholm from Pentester Academy TV, and welcome to our show, Access Point, where we spotlight cybersecurity companies and give an inside look at the people and technology behind the latest advancements in the industry. I'm joined today by John Whaley, who is CEO and co-founder of the company Unify ID. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, great to be here. Awesome. I'm excited to learn more about the company, so let's get started. Yeah, so uh, Unify D, we do something called implicit authentication. We can authenticate you based on passive factors like the way you walk or the way that you hold your phone, about 100 different factors. It's 100% passive, so it doesn't require any conscious action, uh, but we can still tell um, with a high level of accuracy whether it's you or not. And so this is a much better way of doing authentication than, you know, things like passwords or, you know, other, you know, uh, uh, biometrics or other forms of authentication. Very nice. Okay. And so now I'm curious, what made you want to start this company? What's the founding story behind it? So my, my co-founder and I went to a security conference where we, uh, we had a demo there where we uh, took encrypted packet traces like, that we captured via Wireshark for some major products like VMware, Citrix, and Microsoft. And uh, all the traffic was encrypted, but we looked at the timing between the packets. And based on that, we were able to determine the timing of the user's keystrokes. And based on that, we can actually determine what the user was typing. Because you, as you think, as you move your fingers around a keyboard, you know, there's slightly different timings as you, as you type. Right. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but one of the, you know, uh, people were really blown away by this demo. I mean, this, is, this was actually well known, like, all the way back to 2001, that the fact that this was, you know, theoretically possible and you could do this, you know, they showed this on SSH connections. You know, we, we um, you know, what, one of the challenges we had in building that demo was the fact that everyone had their own unique way of typing. And so, you know, we, we um, you know, uh, you know, some people are kind of, you know, the hunt and peck and some people are more, you know, faster touch typing, you know, and, and what we found actually is once we saw you type around three sentences, we could actually uniquely identify you based on the way that you typed. Um, and we began to look at other behavioral aspects, you know, not moving your mouse or using a trackpad. And then we began to look on the phone and the phone contains a wealth of, of sensors and information. Um, Things like, you know, um, from the accelerometer and gyroscope and uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and GPS. You know, each of these signals, they're not um, alone. They're not good enough, like, to, to establish, you know, um, who you are or be able to authenticate someone. Mm -hmm. But when you combine a large number of them together, then uh, you can get something that's actually um, highly accurate and, and highly confident. That is really cool. I didn't even know that that was physically possible. It's almost like having a fingerprint of your own typing uh, skills, essentially. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And now I'm wondering how your solution is different from other solutions out there right now. Um, so um, the type of factors we look at are a little bit different. I mean, so there's a lot of there's a lot of companies that are looking at different types of biometrics. Um, you know, things like fingerprints. You know, vein patterns like within your 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 palm. You know, huh. iris. You know, all sorts of biometrics. Um, you know, all of those require some type of conscious action. You require to you know you have to take a selfie for facial recognition. Mm -hmm. You have to swipe a fingerprint. You know, these uh, these type of things. What uh, we're we're pro uh, focused on more passive. Um, passive biometrics. Um, so things that, you know, you can just be yourself and there's enough that's unique about you that when you actually authenticate you. That's why we focus on as things like gait, like the way that you walk. And it turns out that the way that you walk is is different than, uh, you know, almost everyone else in the world. Wow. Get, uh, like, like with a gait factor alone, we can get ni a 98% um, accuracy um, in terms of with about five seconds of your walking data, just from your phone, you know, um, just, just holding your phone or in, in your phone in your pocket. Um, he had a very high level of accuracy just based on the way you walk because it's different enough between different people. But that's not the only factor we look at. We look at, you know, a number of other motion factors mm -hmm. um, as well as um, uh, factors that are uh, that are about your environment. You know, I mean, what devices you see as you go across mm -hmm. the day, activities you do across the day, places you go, things like that. And so you um, combining all of these together, then, you know, it's... Um, you can subdivide it further and further until you can get a very high level of accuracy that, you know, there's only one person, you know, in, in the world who is, uh, who's exactly like this. And, uh, and so by doing that, you can actually uh, achieve 
uh, you know, authentication uh, in a much more seamless way. And it happens continuously, so you don't have to, um, you know, you don't, you don't really have to worry about it. And when, so if you get up and walk away from the computer, you can, we can know that immediately and then immediately log you out. So um, there's a lot of benefits to be you know, having this type of implicit authentication instead of forcing users to, to go through extra steps. That is incredible. I love that because it really takes a lot of the effort off the user. So I like where the future is going with that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And so I'm wondering what kind of testing has uh, this gone through so far? Um, so it, we've, we've gone through a lot of sophisticated testing with, with determined, you know, sophisticated attackers, you know, even from the, uh, the point of um, having actors trying to mimic other people's behavior. Um, to even testing with identical twins. So people who are genetically the same and but, but it turns out that, that the, so far what we found was that the factors we're using appear to be resilient to these types of attacks. Um, so it turns out that it's actually hard to exactly mimic uh, people's behavior or people's gait, um, as well as, um, you know, it's not just physiological either, because it's also tied to things like muscle memory and, you know, uh, these other factors um, as well. So, um, yeah, so they, there's, um, you know, it, it, and we're, we're getting close to having over a million uh, daily active users um, wow. like running running the software with the uh, with with this running on their phones, and then we're able to cross validate across those there's that very diverse user base, and so that's really what's what's driving the um, uh, the accuracy levels. Uh, when we combine a large num a large number of factors together, we're we're actually able to achieve a 99.999% um, accuracy level. So this is a match of one out of 100,000 um, in in terms of the the true rejection rate uh, for the system. That is incredible. I love where the future is headed so far. I like to say that sounds great. Uh -huh. And so uh, what are some examples of how you're helping with customers right now? Um, so, so many of the use cases today are around uh, on, uh, securing online services or things on, uh, on your mobile device. So mm -hmm. these are cases where, um, you know, they would have traditionally maybe asked for a password or a multi-factor authentication or, you know, other, uh, some, or biometric or other form of authentication, which has more friction. And then, uh, but in, in the cases where you know, um, our, this, the behavior matches at a high enough, uh, at a, at a high enough confidence, then in, in some cases they're able to skip over those checks or, um, you know, and then uh, let you in directly, um, you know, hmm. based on, on some of these things. And so it's, it's really, it's tied to both security and user experience. I mean, you can, you can never think about security in isolation, you know, as a purely theoretical concept. You have to think about security in terms of how it's actually implemented in the real world. You know, and then so if you look at how it's actually implemented in the real world, you get things like passwords where people aren't very good coming up with good passwords. You know, they um, they reuse them all over the place. Um, you know, they, they don't um, it's, they don't really add that much security. It's so easy to get fished. There's a, there's all sorts mm -hmm. of problems. All the human errors, yeah. Yeah, and then if you look at other other things like biometrics, I mean, fingerprints. I mean, you literally like leave them everywhere you go, and you know, I mean, there's so many. Um, you know, by, by this point, I mean, just about everyone's fingerprint has been compromised in some way. It's been, uh, you've, uh, you know, it's, it's recorded at, at your gym or at your, you know, mm -hmm. at, uh, like in your school or all over the place, right? Um, things like face, I mean, face is kind of ridiculous. You think of, uh, you know, like the uh, Apple have been talking about your face is your password. Your face, your face is not your password. Your face is your username. Your face I is mean, everywhere. Yeah, it's a Yeah, good I mean, that's literally the thing that you project to the rest of the world to say, this is me. Um, it's not a very good password. Um, sure. And so, so, you know, but I mean, all these things go and they, they point back to con the convenience aspect. And so if you look at, um, I mean, if you look at security through like, um, through that lens and, and through of how security is actually implemented in the real world, how do users actually use it in the real world? Mm -hmm. uh, then, then you can, you can start to have real discussions about, well, how can we improve security? And many times improving security really means um, uh, like uh, improving the user experience. And then by, by improving the user experience, if you're able to have a system that adds security without forcing the user to go through, jump through a lot of hoops, then you're, you're, up, you're, you're able to do this. Um, you're able to improve security um, in a very real way um, you know, for, for, for real users. Absolutely. I agree with you. The two essentially go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. So to make it easier on people, that'd be amazing. And so now speaking of customers, what kind of companies do you guys mainly work with? Um, it's, it really goes across the board. I mean, many in financial services, like, you know, uh, banks and credit card companies, payment processors, things like that, but also, I mean, social networks and really any app or, you know, or system which requires security and authentication, 
but also cares about the user experience and wants to provide a more uh, friction friction free process. I mean, so one of the we work with one of the major banks um, so that um, you can um, walk up to the ATM. Mm -hmm. You don't need to swipe your card and uh, you don't need to do anything on your phone. You can interact with the ATM and you can get money out uh, just based on the fact that you're not only that your phone is nearby, but also uh, that it's you that's carrying your phone. And there's enough that's unique about your behavior uh, to do that. And, you know, related yeah. related use cases that like for travel, for automotive as well, like keyless entry into cars. Uh, uh, into your house, uh, you know, the, these, these type of things. Because, you know, again, you don't want somebody to be able to steal your phone and then get into your house or your car or, or anything like that. Um, on the other hand, if every single time you wanted to do that, you would have to take out a device and unlock it and swipe a fingerprint or something. That's way too much friction uh, for these cases. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, um, you know, I, I really think in the future, if you think about the, the, the future of authentication, it's going to be much more seamless and much more continuous uh, than, than it is today. Oh, I love that. It sounds good to me. Yeah. And uh, now, how can you ensure privacy while you're collecting all this user data? So, I mean, the, the first thing is that uh, we don't have any raw access to the raw data. I mean, so the raw data stays on the user's device, which is very ah. important because, um, you know, we don't want to become the honeypot for, for everyone's, you know, behavior and, and biometric data. And so we do a lot of the processing locally on the local device. Um, and so even if, you know, we always want to be in the situation that, if we get, you know, when we get subpoenaed or we get hacked or we get otherwise compelled to give up data, then we can legitimately say, well, we don't, we don't have it. I mean, unless you can get it, unless you bring us the person's device, there's, there's, no, we, we can't help you. So um, and we, we always want to uh, be, be in that, in that situation. And then, you know, there's a set of best practices around, uh, around encryption and around mm -hmm. keys and around, um, you know, just operational security as well, uh, which are all very important. Um, you know, when you're dealing with, with this type of data. Because if you think about it, this is really a new class of data. You know, things like the way that you walk or, you know, things about your behavior, it may not be traditionally thought of as like PII or personally identifiable information, mm -hmm. but, uh, but you know, it actually is. I mean, there's a, like, you can tell a lot about a person uh, based on this type of data. And, you know, when you think about the, the in the future of the world where, you know, there's going to be a proliferation of sensors everywhere, you think about, you know, I mean, not only in phones, but like IoT devices and cameras and microphones. And I, I mean, like the sensors have gotten so cheap and so ubiquitous mm. uh, that you can, they're going to be embedded in everything, right? And you think about all the data that's being collected by, uh, by these and what are appropriate uses of, of this type of data, you know, for, for, for self-driving cars and for, you know, all, so, or so, all sorts of um, use, uses. Um, you know, th I think this is, um, it, it's important to be, um, to be respectful of that of that data um, mm -hmm. because uh, it can actually tell quite a quite a lot about a person. Yeah, there's absolutely there's so many that I would have never thought about that could be collected. But like you said, they they matter. I mean, even back in the day, handwriting probably wouldn't have been thought about, but that you know really showed a lot yes. about a person. So it's the new form. It just it's the future yeah. of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so now I know that one of the major issues in the security industry is a huge labor gap due to the lack of cybersecurity professionals. Do you think that education is the main solution in that? Um, you know, I think that uh, certainly that uh, that plays a part. I mean, um, so I mean, I did. Um, so my background. So I um, I did. Uh, I went to MIT for my undergrad and my master's. I did my PhD at Stanford. So I have very you know, traditional academic background. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so, I mean, I graduated, um, my, I finished my, my undergrad in 1999. Um, you know, nowadays you can actually, there are so many great resources that are available uh, online that you don't need to, I mean, you don't need to necessarily go to, um, you know, a university to, uh, to get access to, I mean, great, I mean, uh, great things like open courseware. I mean, literally the same classes that I was going to as an MIT undergrad, like literally now anybody, Anybody in the world mm -hmm. can go and get access to as well. That's absolutely true um, on the in the security in the security space as well. Um, there's a lot of great resources now online. So and I'm seeing more and more people who are self-taught or like have, have they didn't necessarily have that traditional background in kind of you know computer systems, computer you know com computer science or anything like that. But uh, but are, are able to uh, basically learn uh, learn these things online. Um, you know, I think that this, um, you know, that's, uh, so education is one piece, but also getting people interested in it, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and just, um, and, you know, increasing the pool of people who, who are, who love security. I mean, I, I've been working in security for 
uh, for the last 20 years now. Um, I've uh, like, it's, uh, you know, I, I love it, but it requires, it requires a certain type and it requires, you know, a certain type of person mm -hmm. to get really excited about these things about when they see a system, figure out how to exploit it. Um, and then, and uh, figure out where the security holes are and how to defend against these things. You know, these, um, you know, uh, and so I think that, you know, there's, there's things like capture the flag and like, and hackathons and other types of events that I think is, are great because they get people, people interested in it. And, you know, I'd really love to see more, um, you know, get a more, more diverse set of people interested in, not just kind of like, you mm -hmm. know, the, the traditional security professional, you know, or somebody who's, you know, or, you know, the, the, the hacker working on, you know, on something, but, you know, just getting from more and more perspectives, because ultimately, um, I mean, that's what, that's what makes the industry stronger. And that's what, you know, um, because in, including like uh, more diverse, um, you know, points of view and, and, and thoughts, um, you know, ultimately is going to, we end up with, with better solutions. Absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah. And so now I'm just wondering, lastly, what does the company roadmap look for you guys in the future? So, I mean, you know, I talked about this briefly, but this is what, um, you know, in the future we see security becoming much more seamless, much more continuous. I mean, mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, I have a piece of plastic with my photo on it and like, and a mag stripe and like, that's how you know that it's me, you know, you know, in the future, like you walk into your house, you walk into the, you know, or to approach your car, you know, yeah, even brick and mortar stores, um, airports, like travel, hotels, these kind of things. They, um, like technology is gonna exist. So like, they're gonna know that it's you, uh, mm -hmm. just based on these things. Um, and so, and so there's a lot of opportunities there um, as well for like, you know, in terms of uh, providing a very personalized um, experience, but it's also important to like, to do this in a way which, which respects user privacy and, you know, and, you know, especially now nowadays in the age of you know uh, with with Facebook and and Cambridge Analytica and, and things like that, right? You, like we, you always want to. Um, um, I think like the there's some core principles that you know you 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 have to be completely transparent about what data that you're collecting, yeah. but you have to make sure that um, the user has control over it. You know, in terms of being able to opt in, it's like what are what you're allowed to use data for and not, and then and and ultimately, I mean, the user should own their own data i mean like so if a user you know if, if someone um you know if you may uh, allow your data to be used for certain purposes if you're getting some type of benefit from it but that's that those type of things should be made explicit and upfront um mm. you know, which which are uh which are very important but i think you know there's um you know in the future like you know your devices will recognize you your car will recognize you your house will recognize you um, and like all of these pieces of friction you think about in your life about having to remember and type in passwords and you know these type of things like over time those those pieces of friction are going to melt away and it'll start off with online services you know like things on your on your phone and on the computer and then it's going to start to transcend into physical world as well and so you know some of these th uh, some of these things that which we have today um, you know they uh, like around like you know the the, the ID the like the, the physical ID with your picture on it and things like that um, those are going to make it start to become a lot less important um, you know compared to this um, these new uh, these new forms of authentication so yeah and so anyway I'm very excited about like the, about the the future of a um, of a space and you know what what these type of capabilities will uh, uh, will allow us to do in the future. Wonderful. I'm excited too, John. That sounds great to me. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much for sitting down and discussing all this with me today. It was really interesting. I appreciate it. Yeah, great. It was great. It was great being, being here. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing more from you guys in the future. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. If you want to see a full demo of the Unify ID implicit authentication platform, then click the link in the description box to head over to our Pentester Academy TV blog. This episode is brought to you by Pentester Academy, the leader in online cybersecurity education. Join over 10,000 professionals from 90 countries to learn security online. Also brought to you by Hacker Arsenal, artillery for cyber warriors. Visit us on hackerarsenal.com to check out our latest attack defense gadgets. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.